Um, thank you everybody for joining the greenhouse chat. And we are, um, we are um, a, um, a free thinking group, you know, that uh, likes to recommend uh, things to other uh, growers and likes to share ideas, but uh, we do not endorse any products or any uh, companies uh, along the way. We, uh, we share with what we have and the knowledge we have, but uh, it is up to the uh, grower, individual grower, to make the decisions that uh, need to be made and use the rates that have to be used and uh, use your own uh, preferred supply company um, um, in, in, you know, in going forward. So um, hopefully that uh, works for you. Absolutely, that's great, yeah. yeah. So Mirza, yeah. you have some slides for us. Okay, great. I think I will start and then we could get back into the rhythm. Okay, Greenos chat here. Can everybody see it? Yes, we can, Mirza. Okay, I will go into other mode. Let's see. Can I tell you a little, once you're, once you got this figured out, can I tell yeah. you a little story? Sure, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead, yeah. Okay, so um, one of the ladies here at the greenhouse uh, had read on the internet that uh, if you soak a banana peel in water uh, for a couple of days and then you feed that to a tomato, then it produces much better. So um, we, um, <laughs> um, you, you know, we, of course, wanted to try that, you know, she wanted to try that desperately. So, you know, it's a lot of work and it smells, you know, the water, banana water smells after a while. But I said to them after a couple of weeks, I said, we have no control, you know, like a Mirza, if he was doing some scientific research, he would have a control. So I started a plant, a tomato plant, same pot, same variety. I think it's the same variety. That might be only variable because we weren't, we weren't right. quite sure what variety it was. And right. uh, I should I grew that the conventional way. And um, I will share on the uh, uh, greenhouse uh, forum, you know, what the two what the two look like. And uh, what reminded me is your first slide of blossom end rot, um, because you know I think that they use the banana peel uh, as a way to prevent blossom end rot, you know, because it, it's high in potassium. But um, uh, I think it's important to note that, you know, that doing these kinds of things are a lot of work. Using traditional fertilizers, you know, is a lot less work and uh, actually gets you better results. So I will, I will go and take a picture of both of those plants and then uh, I will share that, so. Yeah, yeah, banana peel normally, uh, is a high in potassium. So if any control, we need to know that. Plus it gets fermented quite a bit. A lot of bacterial growth takes place there as well, which is not good. But if somebody wants to try it, you know, yeah. ground coffee and ground beans, uh, if they want to play with that, that's... Uh, all of, okay. all, of, all of those are rich in potassium, uh, ground yeah. coffee, yeah. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. It generally is, is the... Coffee is also rich in potassium. Okay, uh, I will uh, use my exactly the way the way the emails came in. Dr. Mirza, I have a customer who sent me these photos of her tomatoes from her backyard greenhouse. She has been growing veggie for a long time and has never experienced this before. She uses a diluted fish fertilizer and supplements with the nature source. She has never had an issue with her nutrient program in the past. She planted her seedling in ProMix for vegetables. She went away one day. It was very cool when she left, but then sun came out and it got very hot. She did not have the vent open and she is wondering if this is heat stress or is something else going on. Okay, this is how the uh, pictures looks like. Uh, uh, this is uh, this is what I was talking about. Uh, very typical uh, symptoms of uh, 2,4-D pickle, mostly when they form a fist like that, uh, then uh, it is definitely pickle wrap. And on the slide on my right and your left, 
the bottom growth is pretty good, but there's a top growth. So it's not in the bottom, it's not in the growing media. So it is likely a drift. So drift could come, as I was talking before, from a long distance as well. And as Michael was saying, if you're living in a farming community, a lot of sprays are done. So this is, this is what uh, my uh, diagnosis is. It, it's pretty, I think I'm 99% sure that uh, heat would not do that. If there's a heat damage, then uh, the top will wilt. And if the wilted leaves get crispy and uh, they, they are physically damaged quite a bit, you see. In this case, lower leaves are perfect and is the top growth. Uh, so I, I have a question. Yeah. So, so that happened even when her vents were closed? Because yeah, yeah, yeah. The, actually, when there's a heat there, I mean, uh, even through the cracks, uh, there it could come in. If, if there's a, uh, I mean, event is not, there's not foolproof, you see. So that's why the problem was in one corner, it was not spread over uniform. So where, um, I mean, those greenhouse are definitely leaky. So some air could come there, you see. So, I mean, if the, if the vents were open, imagine if there's a fan sucking in, then you will see right across the greenhouse, so all the plants will be affected. So in this case, she noticed in one area, there were more, and then uh, earlier on, uh, the, the question was that why a week before and a week later? Yeah, it could happen a couple of times. And then uh, the damage is visible when the, the new growth comes, then the damage is less, but right away it goes into the tissue. So it's not absorbed to the roots uh, at that time. So this was my reply that this is a hundred-side drift, picoram torn on, 2,4-D little bit, and most of them, they are combination. If, if uh, the herbicide have peculiar names as well, th those are the active ingredient. Uh, Tordon 2E, those are the formulation which have got 2,4-D esters as well. Possibility, somebody spray nearby to kill dandelion. I have seen situation where the grower himself sprayed his own uh, front yard, and that went into the the rain came and that went into his own dugout. And then it was uh, quite a bit of damage that way. It could be a drift from a farmer, even from a distance. A uh, question came back, uh, customers want to know why that wouldn't have affected all the plots in the greenhouse and why it happened once to tomatoes and then again, two weeks later. So it's clear that there, there was, spray was repeated, the drift that could happen several times. So that's where I'm more convinced that it was a drift. Looking at the third picture, it is top of the plants affected. So herbicide is not in water. Check with the, the customer if any weed control was done on her property or anybody smelled the herbicide in the air. The symptoms are definitely of the herbicide. Heat damage is more collapse of the younger leaves, they wilt and then they collapse and, and then the necrosis, they start dying off. And the last question was, would the plant recover? Uh, the one I pictured, showed you picture, they won't recover because photosynthetic area is uh, quite a bit damaged and the way we are already in June now. So the chance that they will set any fruit or flower is minimal. If any plants are less affected than uh, they could produce a new growth uh, and uh, maybe some. And then always the challenge to make a recommendation that if any fruit, would that be edible? I, my recommendation is no, it will not be edible because it will have traces of uh, 2,4-D and picloram is pretty long lasting. So uh, the person who suffered this damage should not use the growing media as a precaution for next year or don't don't put in the compost either because uh, we, we could have some serious issue uh, with the compost because I suspect it is long lasting herbicide. Another one, hello Dr. Mirza, I was wondering if I could ask you opinion on some problems I have been having with my begonias, specifically Iconia and Amstel. I have been noticing throughout the season that my Iconias were just not behaving as they usually do. 
and the flowers were browning and dying very quickly, requiring me to deadhead, which I've never usually had to do within our very short season. The growth has also been different with the new flower sets almost seeming nubby. I good way to describe, I'll show you the pictures. I particularly noticed this on the Amstel and Lemonberry Iconia. It was not until tonight when I decided to deadhead and clean the entire table that I noticed that the nubby ones all have a strange, almost armor-like coating on the stems. On a couple of them, I did notice a little black bug, but unfortunately, as I moved the leaf, I lost it before. It could be a fungus net, you know, it's quite possible. So here are the two pictures uh, which uh, she, she sent, but the real picture is the, this one. So on my right, your left, you see, so that's a, a quite a bit of damage, malformed. Uh, so uh, I scratch my head on about begonias and then compared some previous notes as well in my files. And uh, I'm reasonably sure that uh, is a serious boron deficiency. And remember boron is the biggest problem in, uh, it requires a very small quantity, otherwise become toxic pretty quickly as well. So boron deficiency and calcium go hand in hand. Boron is typically used in close conjunction with calcium because their uptake mechanism is exactly the same. It has to be moving with transpiration, with moving water, high humidity, low humidity, calcium cannot move. And a very hot condition plant is interested to evaporate water, then selectively calcium is not taken up and boron and calcium both go to the cell wall. They are immobile. It cannot move from lower cell to the upper cell. Is also needed to create a new plant cell in a process known as cell division. So if in this case, cells are not dividing properly. So if the cell division is affected, then they become nubby or clubby or whatever. And then in the previous picture, as I showed you, there was some rosetting as well. I mean, the, the way the begonia are showing, some rosetting is also, uh, that's what I'm guessing. So earlier, so, in, earlier in the season, we showed boron deficiency in petunias, yeah, which is yeah, uh, rosetting. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. But um, I, I like, like if you, you like uh, uh, when, when do you see this deficiency? Because I mean, it must be specific to some years and not others. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah with the climate, it could happen. You see, and then your growing media. In this case, she was using nature source, but. Uh, use calcium, uh, stop using calcium later, uh, you know. With this weather, I felt that we have to use calcium for longer. Normally, we make a recommendation of a nature source. So I was using calcium earlier on for uh, uh, end of March, middle of April, but then people stopped using it. With the cloudy weather, I guess, we needed the uh, calcium to be fed uh, for a longer period of time. And then again, Calcium nitrate doesn't have a boron and the nature source boron level are relatively low. And so it, it just happened with the begonias because they're very slow growing as well. So root, uh, so boron can work to regulate hormones and transport potassium to the stomata of the plant. So it's fascinating how this trace element, those uh, opening which regulate the transpiration Stromata, we call them, you know, like this, uh, they affect the uptake of potassium. So those stomata would not open, then plant, uh, due to lack of cell division, the leaves cannot expand properly. While this last function of transport of potassium doesn't sound that important, it is when a plant is unable to transport potassium, the plant might have trouble maintaining the balance of water in itself. So, interesting. yeah, so it was quite interesting, you know, that, uh, and then a couple of species of begonia. I did ask them if other plants showed it, but it was just in the case of begonia that happened, you see. And did she uh, say that other types of begonias, like non-stops, for instance, didn't show the same, uh, the, the same, the same, so the same problems? 
Yeah, that, that's what I understood, you see. But uh, when, they, when she chucked out, uh, I mean, if you notice that uh, they, they, these, the, one of the other diagnostic tests is that look at the stem where my cursor is, car key, car key coating. It is very common on cucumbers. If there's a boron deficiency beside leaf, the fruit will also show this uh, car key uh, because cell deviance, so skin cells are not able to multiply. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when I asked her, she said that some, it was those begonias too were the worst effect. Mm -hmm. A grower couldn't find a label on fertilizer bag. Uh, many times those bags are made from uh, not paper or they're polyethylene bags and the external labor. So she, I said, well, check the inside and then inside the, she found uh, uh, this label. So sometimes the label on the back dislodges. The professional gardener showed me that there's always a second label inside. So when we, uh, we the message is learn to read those labels as well. Uh, for example, in this 15, 10, 30, uh, there's practically very little magnesium, only 0.04%. So at one gram per liter, it will give you only 0.4 pp, and that's not enough. We need 40, 50, up to 70 pp of magnesium. So in this case, total nitrogen 15%, nitrate 10.39, ammonium 4.61, urea none. So it's very important, this information. Nitrate nitrogen is more slow reacting. Ammonium nitrogen is very fast reacting, and urea is the fastest fastest reacting. And that's why when we give nitrate nitrogen to the plant, then it's a more balanced growth on them. If there's a more ammonium nitrogen, then they could grow very rapidly. And it would be a soft growth, then more if it could come if there's a soft growth on them. Urea, we do use uh, as a foliar feed if some nitrogen sim deficiency symptom uh, do come. So this is where we need to know. So one has to add Epsom salt. And last time we also talked that if you have to order Epsom salt from a company, they might come late a week or two weeks. So you could always use the Epsom salt from warehouse, you know, the one you use for foot bath, that's equally good with 10% magnesium. And they must feed calcium nitrate, ideally all together. And this is the message we have been emphasizing in every chat that uh, calcium, many fertilizers don't contain enough calcium. I mean, basically with this inorganic fertilizer, only 17,517 has some calcium in there. If there's a one injector, then uh, alternate days, but Michael and I have emphasized that it's better to give them together. So invest in a second injector, they are not that expensive. Uh, then, what must be added is that um, f certain fertilizers cannot be mixed. That yeah. is why you would need a, a second injector. Yeah. Um, don't, you know, we've all made the mistake where we've added, uh, a, you know, a calcium type fertilizer to, you know, a general feed, something like uh, 15, 10, 30. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, it'll just turn to, to, to bricks, you know, at the bottom, yeah. you yeah. know, so it'll turn very hard. And calcium and phosphate, the middle number, combined become calcium phosphate, which is, which is a gumbo, you know? Yeah. And then uh, many bedding plant growers are also now producing some vegetable, cucumber, tomatoes. So they have to pay attention to monitoring pH and EC of the leaf for vegetable as well. Right, so Debbie raised her hand. Yeah. Debbie, do you have a question for us or you're just waving at us? Hi guys. Um... Well, you're talking about two injectors. If you only have one injector, just have two stock tanks and move the hose over. That's right. That's okay. Right. Like um, sometimes we have to be a little bit more economical because they are five hundred dollars a pop. Yeah, I think that the the only problem which the growers have brought to my attention that before putting from tank one to tank two, you have to flush that because anything in line that's a concentrate there. So make sure that uh, I have seen precipitate uh, blocking the injector. So if you take that feed line, uh, then uh, put in uh, run through 
a few minutes in plain water so that the inline solution is gone then. So you have to change that. Just directly putting it, uh, there are some risk possibilities there. Yeah, but it, I mean, but it, but it I, can but it can be done. Yes. Yeah, but uh, Debbie, I, I think uh, we should budget for a second injection. <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Anyhow, that's a great point. Uh, okay, cucumelon. I didn't realize that this was an interesting. Uh, uh, a person, a grower, sent me this picture. What nutrient uh, am I missing? Right away, the thought goes to nutrients. You know, the puckering of the leaves. Uh, uh, she checked underside, no evidence of thrips or anything. Uh, using nature source at 1 to 100. Last calcium nitrate was mid May when it was so cloudy. So it's basically cold temperature. For cold nights, the leaves become very dark green because nitrate, nitrogen is not converted to protein. It happened with cucumbers as well. So whenever you see this puckering, then suspect the colder night temperature is the major culprit here, not a deficiency of nutrients. And uh, okay, when I went to Google, uh, very interesting. Any of our uh, readers trying this cocoa melon? Oh yes, yeah, we grow some every year. We sell quite a few as plugs and uh, yeah let's say and how it came about is um, a speaker from the Ontario Botanic Garden Paul Zamet right. he uh, he came and and uh, you know he is full of information and good ideas right. Right. and uh, uh, Paul uh, Paul uh, said oh you have to try cucumelon and uh, the seed source available was horrible. Yeah, uh, right. So most of us didn't want to try it because it was right. like 5% germination. But right. now, now Ball has a variety, um, a cucumelon, and they germinate actually very good. So you get in the, in the high 80s and low 90s uh, germination. So um, it's, it's a very cool uh, fruit. And, it's a, and, and your diagnosis is right, Mirza, because we've seen a lot of that puckering on um, cucumelons. Cucumelon is a plant that likes it warm, like cucumbers. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, we're trying to grow it in a house that uh, has bedding plants in it. And we're trying to grow pansies and cucumelon all in the same uh, temperature range. And that's when you get these, um, these things happening. But uh, cucumelon leaves are not generally that pretty. And Michael, are they tasty? Did you ever taste them? Um, they do taste more like a pickle than a uh, than a watermelon. Oh. Um, yeah, the, you know, it still has that very strong cucumbery taste, mm. but uh, the, it, it gets a little bit more watermelony. If you leave them on the plant long enough, they, they turn a little bit pink. Mm. But, uh, you know, you have to imagine the um, the watermelon flavor. It's more the the aesthetics of it and, 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 and the outside of the fruit that looks like a watermelon rather than the taste. So could it be could it be grown in a hanging basket as a novelty crop as well? Yes, so so it climbs like uh, like black eyed Susan or yeah. um, Sunbergia or um, um, uh, other things, you know, right. it, it, you know, Mandevilla. It climbs like that. It 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 attaches to slow moving vehicles or people that sit in the lawn chair too long by the fire, you right. know, on the patio. Right. So uh, so they're quite quite grabby, but uh, you know, yes, they can. They they're the excellent hanging baskets, and they'll 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 climb up the strands of the hanging baskets, and they make tons and tons of little fruit. Yeah, right. Yeah, this is what I was wondering that uh, it should be very interesting crop uh, uh, for bedding plant growers. It's very interesting. Yep. I was actually inquiring about the yellow spotting on the leaves. Yeah, there's a, that could also occur due to cold temperature. And uh, yeah, the, those odd spots could, could happen with the chlorophyll. It's not a magnesium deficiency. So cold temperature because the leaf has puckered there. So it's, it's okay. not a deficiency as such. Yeah, it's not. A, it's, yeah, it, we we see it all the time, Beth, on uh, on cucumelon. Uh, you know, the pretty the leaf isn't super pretty, or or it's kind of like a um, tumbler tomato that makes all these ugly stains on the leaf. You know, yeah, it's really yeah. not a not a deficiency of any sort. It's just the way the plant grows. Yep. So not to worry. Okay. Good morning, Doctor Mirza. I'm having issues with the older leaves of petunias turning color visiting and generally making the plant look unsightly. 
a bit ago, I started reducing the fertilizer for all plants. Uh, could this be the problem? The plants are all flowering well and the pH has been consistent at 6 to 6.2. I stopped adding the calcium in mid-April. Any advice is greatly appreciated. So this is how the picture looks like. Uh, good plants, but uh, off color. So my first recommendation was that, uh, okay, they need nitrogen, start feeding calcium nitrate again. They are starving. Take an EC reading as well, please. Uh, reply, oh my gosh, I'm so glad I asked. We just uh, topped up a water tank and have added the calcium and nature source. The EC is above 15.38 and uh, last time they were feeding 652. So you could see that uh, plants could starve. Normally we say with nature source, you increase the from 125 ppm to 250 and even higher, you see. <laughs> she said, I promise I won't ever try this approach again. Starvation is not a good approach to keep them from growing. We have to maintain their colors. So some, uh, some steps are to take. Temperature is the key and Michael and I have emphasized it in every chat on that. So well, with any of, yeah. And what I see, if you, if you go back to the slide of the picture of the petunias, yeah. uh, they're quite large. So yeah. what happens is, uh, you know, the, the, the pot is more than likely filled with roots. You know, so so those roots need to be fed, and yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Um, like you say, you know, there's 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 nutrient deficiencies there, yeah. but uh, yeah. you know the, the the I think that also that the, the grower could have reduced the temperature earlier, you know, yeah. in order to make the plant a little bit more compact, yeah. uh, and uh, not have this bigger growth uh, at the middle of May. Absolutely. Absolutely. Or, or Michael, any English. comment in the chat there? We have three. Uh, yeah, we have some comments in the chat here. Let me open this up. So when we were talking about uh, fertilizer, um, uh, 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 sorry about the chemicals. The only the only day is was not vented. I'm sure you know how much. I'm not sure how much vented before previously. I mean, we discussed it that <laughs> that the, the chemical can even go through small openings in your greenhouse. Yeah. 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 Uh, could it be Roundup product? Uh, no, because picloran is the active ingredient, you know, in some of the chemicals. Yeah. Roundup is um, um, a glyphosate, uh, you know, so that's a, that's the active ingredient there. And that, and will, kill, that will kill everything, you see, so Roundup, yes, yeah. Yes, okay. Roundup won't show uh, signs of puckering or whatever, it'll just, yeah. it'll be dead, you know, yeah, exactly. the dr yeah. drift will be dead. Um, yeah. Beth is asking, does the amount and the duration of calcium nitrate applied change with the stage of the crop? For example, if the crop is late and still small. Yeah, because calcium might give nitrogen. Remember, calcium not alone. And uh, calcium uptake is a little bit fussy. So not, we, we want the nitrogen as well. You see, it has got 19.8% uh, calcium and 15.5 nitrogen. So we are, and this all nitrate nitrogen. So we are interested in them. Um, so calcium nitrogen is used both for calcium and nitrogen as well. So the question is, you know, should the amount be changed? Um, I think that uh, um, um, what I would want to add is that uh, 75 grams per 100 liters, you yep. know, is the rate that we recommend. Yep. Uh, and at 75 per grams per 100 liter, a, a large plant will take up more because it drinks more, you yep. know, because there's more roots. And, and a small plant, you don't have to water as often. So, um, so it, it, it absorbs, so it kind of regulates itself. So if you stay with, at a simple rate of 75 grams per hundred liters, you're safe for large plants or small plants uh, or, exactly. you know, exactly. yeah. root bound plants or whatever. And I, I have gone up to one gram as well, you know, if, uh, because to take a little more nitrogen there as well. So, yeah. yeah, so it all depends. If it's a large plant, they get more, more amount of water and our nutrients are, switched over or, or delivered more, you see, because they're getting more water as well. Great points. Anything else in the chat? Uh, no, that was it. Okay. So this was a very interesting conversation. So will any of the leaves recover and should I cut them off? I'm so grateful for your willingness to help me and for the solution with kind regards. So that was it. Uh, a customer sent uh, these pixel versions with her tomatoes. 
So this uh, this is how they look like. Uh, how would you describe Michael those symptoms? Unhealthy, lime green, uh, damaged lower leaves, edge burning. Uh, second picture the same way. So a lot of symptom can be attributed to that. So I said that there are multiple issues here. High daytime temperature, exhaust demand for water, and plants cannot meet that demand because of rapid loss of water from leaves. Should be moved to a shady area. If, if they're outside, I didn't know that. If inside the greenhouse, then put a shade cloth. Because sometimes when the sun was out, and if there's no good ventilation, the temperature went pretty high in greenhouses. Their deficiency of potash, uh, that's typical start with the edges. This is a good example right here on the edges. Later on, it will go move inside. Uh, there's a deficiency of magnesium as well, vein cleaning. So check what fertilizer is being used. Likely EC is very high as well, which causes less water available to the roots. Uh, evidence of acid pH is also possible. Whenever I have seen these symptoms on this side here, uh, the, these burning due to pH around five, then uptake of zinc and manganese become four times higher. So th those leaf uh, tips could get damaged quite a bit. So, but yes. Do, do you think that the grower would have added a slow release fertilizer to, to, to is, tomatoes? It doesn't look like at the surface there. So. No. What I would want to add is that, um, uh, you know, things like tomatoes, you know, yeah. who are very heavy feeders. Yeah. It, it seems like uh, even at, at a regular bedding plant feed, that, that's yeah. not enough. Yeah. So yeah. for hanging baskets, planters, uh, tomatoes, um, I, you know, I highly recommend that somebody adds slow release fertilizer, yeah. you know, yeah. a, th a three to six month uh, formulation. Yeah. And, uh, you know, in a 10 inch basket, a couple of tablespoons. Uh, in a 12 inch basket, three tablespoons. Yeah. Um, and um, and then split, mix it in and then fertilize as if it's not there. Yeah. Because, uh, like you say, Mirza, they're starving for just about anything. Absolutely. But, but all those elements you mentioned are available in, yeah. uh, in the slow release. Yeah. 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 Great points. Uh, this is an old picture. I thought I'd throw it in. It's taken in. Uh, around uh, Victoria Day weekend, the pH uh, uh, coming up on petunia, geraniums are combined with the petunias here, and that's the wrong combination. Uh, petunias like uh, more acidic pH, geraniums don't like the acid pH. So in this case, the pH went about 6.4. So when you combine your flowers, always be uh, keep in mind the pH preference of the plants. Uh, this again was an old picture. I thought uh, like blossom and rot uh, problems will be happening, uh, especially if the tomatoes have been grown at cold temperature. And always remember when the seedlings are hardly three, four leaves, the first cluster bud has been already set. So it's 30, 40 days ahead. So if your seedlings were uh, uh, exposed to that cold temperature because many growers, in order to keep the plugs uh, a little bit compact, they use very cold temperature, 10, 12 degrees centigrade, so that they turn purple in color. So then expect this on the first uh, one or two cluster. Basically, cat facing me, poor pollination. The, so due to poor pollination, the fruit appears like this. But it is the is the poor pollination starting during the time that the plant is blossoming? No, or is when, it, is when it... the bud was formed, it, it was damaged due to temperature, but once the flowers open, then the pollen quality, that bud was also formed for pollen. I so see. pollen viability is poor with any which has been grown at a cooler temperature. Okay, so so it, it's it's not at pollination time. It, it's 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 much, when the, uh, yeah. it's much earlier. Exactly. So that reminds me of a story that um, uh, that I heard that uh, um, uh, you told me one time that you know when the first couple of true leaves on a tomato plant open, the, the five but five flower clusters have already been set. Exactly. You know? yeah. So if you do something to that plant at that point. You know, it has a long memory, like a woman. Yeah. yeah. You know. 
<laughs> but but cucumbers, you can fix something really quick. So they're like men, you know, they don't have a very long memory. Hey, Michael, we are surrounded by more <laughs> ladies, so just be careful. <laughs> okay. And there's a fourth comment in the chat, Michael. What is that? Uh, oh, let's see here. Oh, oh I, I, I added the rate. Uh, calcium nitrate, 75 grams per hundred liters. Oh, good. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Uh, just to straight an old picture, uh, there were a couple of reports of cucumber green mortal mosaic virus mechanically transmitted. In the beginning, we talked about different viruses. So this is how the symptom will look like. This puckering is different than the temperature. There are bubbles. So on cocoa melon, that was a puckering, but this is a real heavy bubbling, and that's a virus symptom. And then this is another one very infectious. So if you're going, it could happen at any stage with the cucumber plant. So just be alert and careful to that possibility. And uh, an old slide again, uh, with this cloudy weather. Uh, this uh, basil was showing some uh, uh, botrytis right in the middle. There was some dripping from the roof as well. So just be alert with any plants which are left in the greenhouse. You could space them if space permit now. Uh, crowding, microclimate, condensation could do that. We uh, we talked about uh, watering times uh, yeah. at one time with uh, dahlias, Excellent. and uh, basil is also in that uh, category. It's exactly like you say. If if uh, some dripping came off the roof, that probably happened, you know, at night or in the, in the, in um, late afternoon. Yeah. And then, uh, and then, um, you know, the the moisture on the leaves uh, on things like basil and dahlia, you know, are detrimental. Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. yeah. And then just to show you, after bedding plants, if somebody, anybody wants to grow cucumber, different possibilities are there. I mean, this is the one of the easiest one, followed by Coleman. Every year, they grow a crop of mini cucumbers. So, all the five gallon pails with the standard growing media, fertilizer slightly modified, high potash fertilizer, and this is for their own market. So easy to set up uh, that way. Uh, they grow crop of tomatoes as well. And generally there's no heat in those uh, home houses or very minimal heat. So the, all those leaf is due to um, the curling occurs. Uh, this picture was taken 0918 in September, so plants are fully loaded, but due to heat, the leaves will uh, roll inside. So, so those are two favorite crops grown by people for their own uh, market uh, for selling when the customers come there. Oh, just want to show you, this is uh, okra, lady finger we call it. This is only fruit which goes down upward, you see, so uh, this is, this is upcoming. When I go to Superstore, no, we did some experiment at CDC North. So it can be grown in greenhouses, but productivity didn't compare with cucumbers and tomatoes. Uh, outside, not in our area, but Southern Alberta, it can be grown, enough heat units are there. So very, is a medicinal crop. Uh, it's a slightly, uh, it, it, it produces a mucus type thing and very good for diabetic patients. This is my favorite one for my kidney diabetes. I love to eat it, you see. So just this one old picture, I guess, just should perk your interest. Strawberries, every newspaper, greenhouse Canada, more and more strawberries are coming up. Uh, of course, we grow them in as a bedding plant in their, um, Debbie grows them in her mystery garden as well. So very, uh, in the last newsletter, I put an article from uh, uh, Kathy Knobloch from White Coat. She grows after the berry plants, very successful with minimal heat. Uh, she gave some, how much pound she's harvesting, name of the variety as well. If you want that article again, just let me know. But uh, our local commercial production has not been that successful because it still doesn't beat what we get from cucumbers and tomatoes. So now, of course, Santerra uh, greenhouses have devoted uh, one hectare to strawberries, very sensitive to dry climate. Pordy mildew loves it. Uh, spider mites loves it. 
So a lot more input has to go uh, to grow strawberries on a commercial scale. The price is pretty good. Uh, I see some green also that strawberries coming from BC uh, and uh, pretty these $7.7 plus per pound. That they are sweeter than field grown, but pretty expensive. Uh, our original idea was if Nadine could join us, but uh, she has a baby, congratulations to her. Not me, not that she has a grand, <laughs> grandchild. So don't congratulate her. So she has a baby, she's her grand, <laughs> grand daughter or grandson. I, Michael, was it a grandson or granddaughter? Oh, saw, boy. Yeah, yeah, don't yeah, you know, you're asking the tough questions. Okay, all right. So uh, it's a grandbaby. Yeah, okay, grand grandchild, yeah. So it's a it's a granddaughter. Oh okay, okay, it's great. Okay. Congratulations. Uh, let's shake our hand on the recording sake. <laughs> yeah. So Michael and I thought that we'll put in a uh how to have a simple hydroponic floating system, very simple to design. Uh, this uh, uh, on the left side is a pepper grower. This grew just devoted one area near the roof. Simply is about six inch deep uh, wooden uh, troughs lined up with tough plastic. And then uh, water is water with nutrient and floating is on styrofoam. You put your, your grow and put in there and pretty good job is a recirculating uh, system. Many other examples, I put it in lot of vegetables. Uh, I like this picture. I thought I'll share with you. Tomatoes, beans, uh, uh, guard, you know, now field crop will also be coming in. Uh, this is, uh, what is this, Michael? Or, Swiss, uh, Swiss chard. It's a Swiss chard. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Swiss chard uh, can be grown. No, this is in benches. So movable benches, same basic structure, uh, wood frame, and they're lined up with the plastic and about six inches deep. And then uh, these are individuals, uh, four by eight type benches and grow a variety of crops. Uh, uh, this is a lettuce as well, uh, different color mixes as well. Uh, this is again, the basil is on the right. Is it this basil is, or? No, this is lettuce or well, basil in the background, I think. Or oh, no, that's bok choy. This box, sir. Yeah. yeah. So different color and lattice is in the front here. So floating system are very, pretty good. Uh, um, then the teal greenhouses uh, is this is some pictures on their website. Naked green uh, dry hydroponics they call it uh, is only dry. They say that the way they grow the plot on styrofoam, the base of the stem doesn't come in touch with water. This is a special design that's only the roots are growing. So it was a big job. They have to dig out, uh, they're, they're called race canals. So instead of uh, uh, on styrofoam, styrofoam come, but these are much deeper. These are at least 18 to two feet deep uh, canal system. Uh, here she was when, so when they dug out this one, so they have to have a concrete lining right here. So a lot of work was done. And she's now, of course, uh, promoting her product. She was experimenting with uh, on a small scale. This is how on those styrofoam. So it could be a small scale. I know a couple of growers I recommended when wedding plant people come, customers come, have uh, some. This is a very innovative. You know, people could buy a live lettuce as well. So add a little bit extra revenue. Uh, your children could learn as well. And uh, if you could give a project to one of your child, okay, do this. I think they will really enjoy and learn as well. Oh, she is growing lettuce uh, pretty good right here. This is her uh, setup. And uh, she's a good marketing girl. So uh, growing a different type. This is leek right here, different type of salads. She grows uh, cilantro as well. I like it. I remember one year when we had a workshop at Michael, we, she gave us a pack to give as a every party spend. Michael, you remember that? I do, yeah. Those are yeah. beautiful vegetables. Yeah. Hopefully with the pandemic gone, we could repeat that, I guess, next mm -hmm. year. Yeah. And this is our setup uh, floating hydroponic system. Water moves from one canal to the other one. 
and she's using some LED lights there. And the last one, when uh, uh, I was uh, about half an hour ago before we started our chat, uh, Dr. Mirza, what is the, this, this is a very interesting question, no? Uh, Dr. Mirza, what is the rate of 2020? I want to switch to this, that fertilizer. I said, why do you want to switch that? I have blossom and rot. What are you using right now? I'm using 5627 and calcium nitrate. So I said, why do you want to switch that? Or to control the blossom and rot? I said, no, blossom and rot is a calcium deficiency caused by not a lack of calcium in feed, but due to not active climate. When the climate is not good, uh, high humidity, plant is interested in absorbing water only, would not absorb calcium and other nutrient, low humidity, then plant cannot transport water and then no nutrient, especially calcium doesn't absorb and blossom or not come. High relative humidity and low relative humidity, high EC could also cause water restriction. I've seen now in uh, cocoa bag, the EC has jumped to 4.5, even five, simply because plant is selectively absorbing water when the light is very high around noon time to 3, 4 p.m. And that's where the blossom and rot is coming. So just assuming that 2020-20 will cure my blossom and rot is not, a, uh, is not a good approach. Remembering, and that's the purpose of Greenhouse Chat, that any tip you could gain from it, we have whole wide discussion right from February to this is our last, second last chat. A lot of interesting problem and fertilizer knowledge we have tried to give to our listeners. All right, I will stop sharing and any comments, questions are there, we could go ahead otherwise. Um, in the chat, uh, I know we have no other uh, thing. I think we have a new, uh, a new guest, a Pete. It might be Pete de Vry. That's oh, really. Uh, oh, we should. Yep. Welcome hey, him. And after yeah, a right. long time, we we'll see. <laughs> Hi, Peter. <laughs> um, okay. So, um, yeah. So you shared with us, uh, you know, some of the um, accolades with um, um, with uh, uh, Nadine, who uh, you know, who started this uh, floating vegetable. Um, yeah. uh, segment of her operation um you know a bit of history um that we had a greenhouse in in our area called holes greenhouses who um who moved uh, and called themselves the enjoy center after after they didn't call themselves it was holes at the enjoy center but they built the enjoy center and um uh, nadine and her husband bob uh, acquired the old uh, range from uh, holes they took it down and they moved it all to their farm at bruderheim and uh, they rebuilt some of it. And one of the portions that they rebuilt, now they're having the, uh, they have the vegetable uh, operation in there that she calls Naked Greens. And I guess the name came from the fact that it was, you know, uh, a grown pure, uh, no herbicides, um, you know, it was a, a kind of a catchy name. So that was her, that was her um, <clears throat> business model. And then, um, and then she started marketing and growing from there. So she is, she's done a very good job, you know, in carving out a, a market share. And I guess what we're trying to accomplish here tonight is, is the fact that, you know, there's other things that you can do uh, in the off season with your greenhouse, if you, if you so choose, um, you know, things like vegetable or vegetable crop, you know, in, in existing greenhouses or, um, you know, strawberries or, you know, other, other small fruit, you know, that you could, that you could uh, extend the season with. Uh, both uh, both um, in the at the end of bedding plants as well as into the fall because you can close the greenhouses up at night um, and and retain some of the heat and you, that is still very valid that's still very effective you know to grow vegetables and stuff into the later season now even things like uh, Mirza, like uh, she's growing bok choy and things like that you know do they require the same kind of climate as uh, say the lettuce or yeah, would you? Cool. Yeah, yeah they're, they're, they're cooler temperature crop. Absolutely, all those yeah. leafy vegetables require a cooler temperature. Absolutely, that is uh, that is good. So yeah, so we we got an, an email message from uh, Bill McCurry, who might have had some uh, video footage to share 
from last November. And I'm just going to see here if uh, uh, at the start of the meeting, he hadn't sent any messages yet. Um, no, he hasn't. Uh, he hasn't sent anything yet. Um, Oop, he hasn't sent anything yet, um, you know, yeah, at this point. Um, a couple things. So in two weeks, we're having our last um, um, grow, uh, greenhouse chat. And uh, uh, something that uh, will be of interest there is that we, uh, we have three speakers at that uh, point. We have, um, I'll repeat it again for anybody that has, did, didn't listen to the recording or came late. Um, we have um, uh, the, the company Think Plant uh, returning. And they're going to tell us about their favorite perennials for zone three, which is what which we are in Alberta and the Saskatchewan. And um, they're also, uh, we have a speaker by the name of Paul Cool, and he's with uh, BioBest. And uh, because last week we asked what, what uh, area did we not cover yet? What part did we not cover? And somebody said, we would like to know more about biologicals and uh, not so much you know how they work or whatever but more so on, on how to order them you know and and how many to order and that kind of stuff so those are some of the questions that i've uh, going to send to um to paul so he can talk on that and last but not least um talking about vegetables and extending the season um, i've reached out to big marble farms uh, david hoekstra who is the general manager there and uh, david has agreed to meet with us in uh, two weeks and do a presentation on large scale uh, vegetable growing. So uh, it may not be for everybody, but it, you know, it will probably blow your mind, you know, if you see how they market things, um, how their relationship is with um, Red Hat Co-op and that. And then last but not least, uh, Debbie and I are working together with Duman to do uh, new blooms. And this year, June, new blooms will be on June 30th. So it's a little earlier than other years. Uh, new, normally it's after cultivate, but um, it'll be before cultivate. Uh, this time, June 30th will be uh, the day. So um, um, we'll ask Debbie to, uh, you know, create a, a post for that, um, you know, on uh, uh, social media or, um, you know, do something with um, Eventbrite so we can have something. Um, but um, be aware that uh, we did lose our, we, we, it looks like we might be losing some of the funding that we normally enjoyed through, um, through Duman. Um, they, uh, they have restructured and they may not be able to participate as much as they'd like, although we're begging and pleading and um, um, answering their questions to see if we can get this grant money. Uh, Merz and I were talking about how scientists nowadays are tied up so much um, applying for grants from the government rather than doing research. You know, I'm feeling the same pain, uh, Mirza. I'm, a, I'm, I'm spending time communicating with Duman to get money, you know, for an event while I, you know, my, maybe should be in the greenhouse, you know, and, uh, and watering stuff or growing things. So, um, so hopefully that comes, uh, comes through and that they, um, that they will step up and sponsor it. Um, otherwise, you know, we're going to have to make, uh, Debbie and I are going to have to make some alternative plans to see if we can still put it on in some shape or form. But uh, just just be aware that um, you know what's happening. But we're keeping our fingers crossed that Duman will come through and um, sponsor the event again, like they have all the all the other years. Okay, is there any other questions from anybody? Did we cover everything? Um, uh, did we? Um, um, yeah, is there anything that we haven't covered? I just want to know more about uh, how the things are going, Debbie. From your viewpoint. Uh, Pretty good season, pretty good sales. I know the way you are marketing, uh, you are doing great, but uh, is the season late? Are people asking different type of questions or what's going on? Um, I, I mean, because the season's late, later than normal, it feels like sales are later, yeah. but we are just as busy. We're actually busier than previous years because of the social media all the posts right, and right, video right, right. um people are really loving it and sales are right in line with last year for us i've i've heard that it's a bit lower for other people but i really think it's the the videos 
Yeah, but it yeah. might it might still come. Like for the people who are saying it's a little slower, we're we're yeah. in the first full weekend of June, and uh, I think traffic is still fairly um, fairly brisk. Yeah, yeah, I I think so too. And you know, I've had people come in and they're like, "Oh, I feel like it's so late this year." And I said, "This is the first week we don't have frost in the forecast. Like you're not late. You've got lots of time." So yeah. I think it's just kind of reiterating that. Yeah. Marjorie has her hand up. Do you want to unmute, Marjorie? She's waving at us. There we go. I didn't think I had my hand up. Maybe I brushed my hair or something. Oh, <laughs> Sorry. Okay. okay. Well, how's the season been for you, uh, Marge? Actually, we were quite busy up to about June 1st, and things tailed off then. Mm. And we're pretty well done. We still have vegetables we've sold a few more flowers but we're pretty well done mm -hmm. it was a good year a really good year good good in spite and of the, in spite of the cooler weather in spite of the cooler weather things were slow to start we did a wonderful thing though we had a greenhouse tour we arranged a greenhouse tour with all the greenhouses around us and that really got people from the cities coming out to our greenhouses. Lots of times they don't know the country greenhouses at all. And so because we really marketed this greenhouse tour, people came from Swift Current and we had repeat sales from Swift Current a lot, which really surprised us. We thought for sure they wouldn't venture out an hour out of Swift Current, but they did. And uh, I think we had 11, greenhouses participating in that where wow. um, it was a drive yourself type of tour, but we'd have groups of ladies, four ladies to a vehicle and they would come out to our greenhouse. We had that early though. That was probably the beginning of May. Next year, we hope to do it a little bit later when the, everyone's really into the planting. So Marjorie, uh, did, did, you, did you say that once they were there once, they came back, they came back to buy some more plants. They, they, you had repeat customers from those people? Yes, we did. Because when we had the tour, it was too early in the season. People weren't quite ready and it was still cold out. Nobody was buying much to, uh, to plant, but they went on the tour because they had the time. And then uh, they came back later and they bought plants from us. So mm. it was a really good experience so they they uh, they realized that uh, we're not unapproachable like we're we're, no. we're within reach like even though you're an hour out yeah. of fifth current you know people yes. were still they saying, oh well we made the drive once we'll do it again now we're ready yeah. to buy plants well and i think they enjoyed going to the different greenhouses i mean there's a couple greenhouses in swift current but they enjoyed going to the different ones out in the country and we we gave them options for restaurants we gave them options that they wanted to stay overnight and say gravelberg and stuff like that um it was really kind of a neat idea good well debbie did something similar um debbie if you want to just uh, advertise the um the the, the the green alberta greenhouse map yeah i i think marissa touched on it last time i was on but um I made a Google map adding as many greenhouses from Alberta that I could find. And I called it the Alberta greenhouse map. And um, I, I encourage each province to, to do the same. Like someone just take charge, take the lead and, and make a map. It's free and it's fairly straightforward, but um, I've, I've, had so, I've had so many people come in um that have been using the map that have discovered new greenhouses in their own area they didn't know about um people going to as many as they can it's 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 been very good yeah that is true yeah. the saskatchewan greenhouse growers had a map at one time but it really needs to be updated so we had a we were lucky enough to have one lady who's really good with computers and she did she put all of our 11 greenhouses on this map and then she had the restaurants and she had the accommodations on there so it it worked out good for us 
It's just yeah. something that the Saskatchewan Greenhouse Association should get a map up and on their website. <clears throat> How many do you have now on the map, Debbie, in Alberta? I think it's 193. Wow. <laughs> That's yep. good, Debbie. I've, yeah. I've got a few more to add. And so what I did is there's a Facebook page called Alberta Gardening. And I posted the map I had. And I said, I know there's more greenhouses in this province. Please comment below with the Google link of greenhouses that are missing. So, of course, there was like 400 or 500 comments. And the problem is people didn't look at the map. So I'm like, well, that greenhouse is already on there. I'm like, look at the map. Yes. and then yeah, right, yeah. So yeah. it, you know, it took a few hours, but it only took a few hours. Yeah, yeah and I find like, we have one new greenhouse that started up in our area and a lot of people didn't even know she belonged. She was out there. And yeah. so it was really good to do this. It was good to have it on the map and people would come out and she's closer to swift current than we are. And mm -hmm. uh, but we, it was just very good. <clears throat> yeah. And that's how our map started was with uh, a dozen greenhouses in Sturgeon County and I didn't add any restaurants or accommodations because I thought there's no there's no end to it then it's then yeah. it's an entire Google map if we keep going um, so I, I stuck it only to greenhouses that are grower retailers and that's good I just we just thought like we wanted to, like there's probably an hour and a half between me and the furthest greenhouse that was on that map and we yeah. thought like Gravelberg is a French community. It just has lots of culture. It would be a great place for people to stay overnight. I, like there's, there's people around here like doing girls trips. So yeah. this would have just been a girls trip to go to different greenhouses. It was just a fun, fun time. Yeah, yeah. I believe it. Yeah, yeah I, I, think we did, I think we did that same concept in 2018 and 2018. Okay. And and then I took the, that map and I just started adding more greenhouses to that existing map. Yeah. And it doesn't take much, does it? No. As long, sure... as, as long as business owners have a Google pin, it's easy. Yes. Yeah. And I think our Greenhouse Association probably has a list of a lot of greenhouses in Saskatchewan. It's just that somebody needs to take the initiative to make a map of them. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, Pete, uh, do you want to chime in, you know, uh, how your season has been? Just unmute and um, chat away. Oh, maybe he's on another call. All right. So uh, you asked Sandra and Beth already how their season was, Mirza, at the beginning of the... Yes, uh, we did. But uh, at that time, I was the only one, so maybe they could share. Sandra? Well, we were part of that same tour that Marge is talking about. And actually, there was a group of women from the local lake here that came in a limousine. So they went and toured all of our greenhouses in a limo. And I tell you, you don't feel any better as a grower when you see a stretch limo come into your yard with a group of like it was it was something really special and they said that they were going to continue to do it and that they hope that maybe next year we would add in you know like kind of like a poker guru thing or one greenhouse you stop and you might have lunch and the next greenhouse you might stop and have coffee or the next you know like just adding different things in to make it more interesting so but it, it was good and as far as people, it was busy. We always have our groups. You have your beginners, they come in, they want what they want because they're scared it's going to sell out. Then you've got your Mother's Day group. Then you get your long weekend group. Then you get your group of ladies that come in after seating's done because they can't plant anything or look after stuff because they're busy working on the farm. But lately, it seems like the, the more the gas is going up, I don't know if that's deterring people now about whether they why they've slowed down or what but it's cold here again like it was nice and then all of a sudden it's it today it feels like winter it's it's gross and I think it really shuts people down but there's still lots of people coming in for vegetables people that haven't planted their gardens yet because they know better they don't want to get burnt and and 
have it freeze. So I'm still hopeful that we we have maybe about a third of the crop left to get rid of. So I'm not too concerned about it. I usually end up with some, and then the hydrates usually come in and clean you out at the end of the year. So <laughs> it works out. And uh, Beth, um, how has your season been? It has been amazing. Um, we're above last year, but significantly, which is good seeing as we have that new greenhouse. We've had two different bus tours where they come in with a big, huge passenger bus. Um, we've had people with stock trailers that have to park out on the road and walk in. Um, we've, yeah, lots and lots of people traveling from one place to the next place and such. And as much as I like sharing with other greenhouses and such, I wanna be the first greenhouse that they stop at. So it makes a difference in how much they purchase. So that's what the end of this, at the end of the day, that's what matters. Um, we still have lots of stock left, but I might have over ordered. So we'll see what the end of the year brings. Thanks, Beth. So are you still, what, how much do you have left, you think? Do you, uh, was your season later? Like, I mean, it was, it's above year over year or year to date? Um, our season started early. We opened earlier than we ever have. Um, we've been pushing social media a lot and a new website where people can go, they can check out our trees and shrubs and do their shopping online, come and pick up. Um, so that's helped even just for the research aspect, we're not seeing a huge amount of e-commerce turnover right now, but it's handy to be able to send them to a place and then they research more and say, you know, I don't want just that one, I want this one and they call and they follow up. So at least it's a good way to get your foot in the door and turn those um, feet into sales, so to speak. So it's been good. Cool, cool. And you're planning to open how long yet? Uh, we'll be open till October. Oh, you're going to be so, open. Oh, all summer. Yeah, yeah. We do trees and shrubs and perennials. We got um, two different grants this year for summer students. So we'll be able to have summer students and do some much needed revamping of the yard flower beds and that we never get time to. And by the time we have time, we're too tired to do anything about it. So yeah, so it, it will be interesting. So mm, that'll be cool. That'll be cool. Yeah. Yes. Finish off some of these projects, you know, that are otherwise half done. So yeah. Yeah, exactly. Or not even started, but they're on the <laughs> dream list. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. Okay, and Debbie, how long are you staying open, you think? What's your plan for the summer? Um, we're gonna do the same as last year. We'll be open all summer um, and through fall and probably till mid-December. Um, in the summertime, I staff it though, so I don't have to be there. And yeah, it's gonna be great. Mm -hmm. And Sandra, um, how long are you staying open yet? I am not sure. Maybe into a bit of July, I need to take a bit of a break. I grow chrysanthemums over the summer for fall. So we usually open up beginning of September again when the kids go back to school and then we, we sell the mums. We do fall decor. I have a gift shop too. We do craft classes. And then we take everything down at after Halloween and we set up, shut down for two weeks and set up for Christmas. And then we're open right till right for Christmas. So yeah. our Christmas season is just about as big as bedding plant season here. Wow. That's awesome. That is very awesome that uh, you, you've grown that market, you, you, uh, that time of the year. Yeah, well, it's, it's funny. We've been here since we've moved here from Cabri. So I was growing in Cabri for five years and then we moved here. And we've been here since 2017. And I still, every day I've been getting people, we never knew you were here. Of course, I have a girl that's like really awesome with social media. She's young and she's got the experience. She knows she, she's not scared to get into the computer thing. She's, she's bound up my website. She does all of our Facebook. She's a photographer too. So she does awesome pictures. 
and she has really brought in a lot of new people so and once they come once they come back mm -hmm. they just enjoy mm -hmm. coming out like i said i'm out 20 minutes south of swift current we live in a small mennonite village and we have a, like we do coffees and lattes and all that kind of stuff too we have a playground for the kids and they just come out and they just chill out here and they sit around and they have a coffee their kids play and they just love it they say this is their happy place and they just like to get out of the city and come out here so it's it's nice to be able to provide that for them you bet and in the in the process they're buying a few things oh yeah no there's always something in the gift shop that they see and want to bring it and bring take home and like i said at christmas time we do live premium trees and all the green greenery and craft supplies for doing outdoor pots we do christmas parties now we're starting to do events here like we're hosting birthday parties and baby showers we're doing our first wedding out here on the 30th of july so we have a big event tent because we do market like uh, mother's day we do a big market in the fall we do one and at christmas we do one we usually put through between five and six hundred people so we have vendors about 40 vendors we do we have a guy who plays Santa. We do professional photos. We have horse drawn or uh, sleigh rides with horses. We do uh, lunches and yeah, so we have lots going on. You can't just run, you can't just be a greenhouse. You can't just make it on plants. You have to have more going on to keep your building going because it's just with the cost of everything. Yeah, so. Very cool. Very cool. We were at Dutch Growers one time and they managed to make. Um, Halloween into their third largest season, bedding plants, Christmas, and then Halloween. So there is other seasons of the year where you can, um, you, you can capitalize on, uh, on sales. And that's the thing, like fall is such an overlooked season. It's one of the most beautiful times of the year where everything changes color and starts to slow down and the kids go back to school and you know, people overlook it and we've just really started to get people back into it, getting into decorating and having some fall stuff and having some mums out on their porch. And then last year we did a kids Halloween party. We grew, we grow pumpkins and squashes and stuff here and then sell them in the fall. And we brought a bunch of kids in and they carved pumpkins with their parents and we had games and yeah. So we were just trying to make it so that people realize there's other things to do than, you know, being in the city and spending your money there. You can come spend it out in the country. <laughs> yeah, no, very good. Very good. Very good. Uh, uh, very good insight on uh, how your business operates, Sandra. That's great. Yeah. Okay. Mirza, anything yeah, else? I guess uh, that will be it, I guess, if uh, everybody has shared and uh, uh, our uh, Next one will be in two weeks, the last yep. one to recapture. And as Michael said that uh, we are inviting some uh, good people on biological controls, IPM, veggies. So that'll be very interesting to wrap up. So that will be pretty nice. Well, thanks everybody for joining us. And this, um, this, this uh, chat will be available on YouTube in a few days, Mirza. Yeah, I, absolutely. And one announcement that uh, I have a good publication available on hydrogen peroxide use. So if anybody interested, drop me an email. I could send you a copy. This morning, uh, somebody asked me for it. So it's just fresh in my mind. So how to use it end of the season uh, for algae control, for disinfection. So just let me know. Good. All right. Have a uh, so type in your before you go, type in your email address for people who don't have it. Okay, because you, you have a you have a couple, you know, one is consulting and one is green, and yeah, so. that's the easiest one. I could do okay. that, uh, Dr. Mirza Green at gmail.com. Okay, spelling the correct, yeah, okay. Good. Yep. So then, um, and then everybody that wants the, the publication, I I happen to know about it. This publication on um, uh, hydrogen peroxide, and it's it's very good. Yep. All right. Take care, everybody. Others are winning, so hopefully they'll be. <laughs> oh. oh, you were watching <laughs> the hockey game too. <laughs> Take care.
So have a great night, everybody. Okay, good night. Good night.